steps that strides forward 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 this is strides forward a podcast of stories about women and running i am thrilled to welcome you to the very first episode i am sheree louise turner your host and producer for the first series of episodes each of which will center on one runner i'm focusing on experiences in and around the comrades marathon the very first story features a runner who has strong ties to this race. My name is Devin Yanko. I live in San Anselmo, California, and I started running, I ran my first marathon in 2005 and my first ultra in 2006. Before we hear Devin's story, there are a few things to know about Comrades. It's a 90 kilometer or roughly 56 mile road race that takes place each year in South Africa. And it's the oldest and largest ultra-distance foot race in the world. Comrades turns 100 years old in 2021, and entries for the 2020 race are capped at 27,500 runners. Now, you may be wondering about the fact that this is called the Comrades Marathon, but marathons aren't that long, typically. And you'd be correct in this wondering. Comrades is an exception in this area where marathon is used to mean a very long distance. In almost all cases, when someone is referring to a marathon like the Boston Marathon, the New York City Marathon, or the Olympic Marathon, they're talking about a race that is precisely 26.2 miles or 42 kilometers long. And so terms like ultra marathon, ultra, or ultra distance those are all referring to anything that's longer than that 26.2 miles. That's why you'll hear people like me in this podcast called the Comrades Marathon and Ultra. All right, now back to it. The 90 kilometers that the Comrades covers goes between the coastal city of Durban and the smaller town of Peter Maritzburg in the hills. Each year, the race switches direction, making for up years when it finishes in Peter Maritzburg, and down years when it finishes in Durban. The course features what's known as the Big Five, five climbs or descents depending on the direction the race is going, each of which has been given its own name. It's like the way we call the last climb of the Boston Marathon, Heartbreak Hill, but where the infamous heartbreak rises 91 feet in just over half a mile, the shortest but also steepest climb at Comrades, Polly Shorts, or Polly's as it goes by, goes on for just over a mile and it climbs almost 400 feet. Again, that's the smallest climb. Most of the rest of the course is continuously undulating. So even outside of the Big Five, there's more climbing or, of course, on the down years, descending. And lest you think that the down run sounds like the easier choice because of all that gravitational help, know that running downhill for that long is punishing on the legs and feet. Experienced comrades runners will commonly say they actually think it's harder, especially because unlike ultras in many other parts of the world, and especially in the U.S., this course is not run on trails. It's on pavement. That pounding, it takes its toll. And there's more. Comrades is also notoriously exposed. That is, there's very little in the way of shade, and it's hot, even though it's run during Africa's winter. All these factors combined, the length, terrain, weather, make Comrades a uniquely tough challenge. And this is what keeps many runners returning year after year. Devon is one such runner. And a bit about her running career— since she started in the sport back in 2005, Devon has established herself as an elite ultra-distance and marathon runner. She has range, and she's versatile, excelling on the trail and the road, which isn't common, especially at her level. For instance, she's qualified twice for the U.S. Olympic Trials Marathon, and she has also won and set course records in ultra-distance trail and road races up to 100 miles long. As regards Comrades, Devon has placed in the top 10 in each of her three finishes there, 2012, 2017, and 2018. And yet, she's got unfinished business at Comrades, and it may not be what you think. It is a race that uh, I, I started this year calling it my white whale because I feel like 
there are some races that I've done that I'm like, I feel satisfied, right? Like I don't have to necessarily win a race to feel satisfied, but like, I feel like there are a lot of races where I'm like, I'm, I feel like I've run to my potential and figured out enough factors that I can walk away from a race and never need to do it again. But there's something about comrades that is so complicated to get right that I've never felt like I've nailed it. So how did comrades become Devon's white whale? That has its roots in a time before she even called herself a runner. When I was in university, I actually did a study abroad and spent three months in Cape Town. It's actually, interestingly enough, also where I started training for running, really, because some of my roommates were like, hey, we should run a couple days a week. And then it was, hey, we should run this half marathon. And so I have this strong connection in terms of place, but also it's where my running career really started. Now, there are a lot of great races near Devon's home in Northern California's Marin County. And beyond that, there are excellent races throughout the United States. So why fly halfway around the world for comrades? So I just I just love it. I keep going back despite the fact that 30 hours on an airplane shreds my face every single time. But it's just such a unique experience. Like I have tried for years to explain to people what it is like. And it is just something that people have to experience. There's just nothing that equates to what it is. While it is difficult to get across what it feels like to experience comrades, there are several things you can point to that begin to create the picture. There's the fact that this race has existed for almost a century. I mean, that's incredible to think of everything to think of the fact that this race has existed for so long and been a part of so much history and also embraced, you know, the cultural diversity of the country before politically they did, like that race has always been a unifying force. This unifying force Devin talks about, this is a powerful factor here, and it's fueled by several things, including the difficulty of the event. When people are joined in suffering, differences tend to disappear. From the spectating standpoint, running differs in an important way from many other popular sports. There are no teams that pit us against them. People may have a particular runner they're excited about, sure, but no one's going to be rioting over wins and losses. Even more to that point, the support and enthusiasm extends far beyond the racing aspects of this event, because while Comrades attracts top elite runners from around the world, the event is largely about the masses. Add to all of that, South Africans have a deep passion for sports in general and a particular pride around Comrades. It's as iconic as like the New York City Marathon or Boston. And my thing is, it's like, it's, it's that iconic, but the whole country cares. And there's nothing like that in running in America that you can find where, you know, if you say, oh, I've done this race, not everybody knows what you're talking about. If you go to South Africa and say, oh, I've done comrades, like I've gotten waved through customs because they had seen me on TV. Like I had a really short connection through Johannesburg on my way home and I get to customs and I hand him my passport and he's like, you know, he looks at it, but he's like, I don't need to see this. I saw you on TV. And I was like, what? <laughs> he's like, just go. And it was how it's so in the States, ultra running is so uncommon that to have somebody that I would have thought like, oh, wouldn't know anything about running or ultra running to have just your average person know what that means. It's just, it's, it's so important to the country. And that just to me makes it a different race. The amount of television coverage is another of those elements that sets comrades apart. If you can't be there in person, you can watch all 12 hours of live coverage on TV. And it all begins at the start line. I'll get into the beloved traditions of the start line proceedings in future episodes because they're really quite special. But here I'm just going to focus on one aspect of getting off the line that is particularly critical to racers at the front— Everyone starts at the same time. With most major races where there are thousands of athletes, 
the elite fields, or at least the elite women's field, starts before the rest of the runners. Races like the Boston and New York City marathons break it down further and start non-elite racers in waves. But at Comrades, Devon and her co-competitors have over 20,000 athletes crushed in behind them, eagerly waiting to get cut loose. And one more thing, the start time is early enough in the morning that it's still dark out. That start line experience is unlike anything else um, I've ever done because it is so intense and we the the elites are kind of like sequestered away to the side and then how you know 20 minutes before we get put in front and the women are put on one side and the men are put on the other side and I always get a lot of emotions some terror some excitement some like nostalgic oh I love this country I love this race kind of feelings but it is also funny just because the start line for me is also knowing that you have to essentially run as hard as you can off the line so that you don't get trampled because the people behind you charge so hard, you would think that they're running a 5k. So I just think it's funny. You have this like mix of this sense of like, okay, I'm going to race. But the first thought in my mind is just get out of the way. So yeah, you just start an 89 kilometer race with a full sprint. And then, of course, there are the supporters all along the course who go wild from the gun. The, the crowds are amazing. I, I've run some major international marathons like Boston, New York, London, and that's the only thing that I can really equate it to. It's like, except for it's, you know, more than twice the distance and you just have people lining the course and they're so excited and they're so into the sport and there's just so much enthusiasm and you can just tell that everybody cares about this race. I have had so many times in the race where the crowds have lifted me up when I've gone through a like, you know, a low moment. I can remember the last time I did it, like running through literally like a tunnel of people, like it was only as wide as, as my body and like just running through this screaming tunnel of people. And it just lifted me up in a way that I needed right at that moment. Runners, including the elite women, of course, are continually surrounded by spectators, yes, but also by other racers because of that mass start. In other large races where the female elites start on their own, they typically end up running either in small packs or by themselves. At Comrades, they're in a sea of primarily high-caliber male runners, whoever can keep their pace. For Devon, she's found upsides to this format. If I'm on my own, I can definitely get all up in my own head and get, you know, like all aboard the crazy train. So it's nice to have someone there to just be like, I am having a hard time. And they'll be like, well, just keep going, you know, like just to have somebody to kind of bounce your ideas off of instead of just like marinating in them. It really makes a big difference. All of this attention the race generates can also lead to dynamics that top ultra racers don't normally deal with. My first time doing Comrades, I was leading at 50K, and it is very different because ultras here, you're running around in the woods by yourself, basically, you know, and even when I'm running a marathon, for the most part, the marathons that I'm doing, there's not that type of coverage you know there I'm not like have a camera in my face going I wonder what they're saying about me right now do I look like a t-rex when I run like am I making a face you know like all of these things and you get caught up in some of the hype and I you know I was kind of unprepared for how much that would affect me because I think I kind of got caught up in the adrenaline of it a little bit but it is just it's it's so different. You know, I've, I've run in races here. We, I have like a bike pacer and you're just like rolling around, like talking to this one person on the race. And then you come into the finish line and they're like, okay, you're done. Comrades is just the, like the total opposite of that. Taking a step back and stripping away all of the awesomeness of this race. And you're left with the foundation of any proper white whale challenge. It's really hard to conquer. Note that here, Devin mentions western states, which, 
founded in 1977, was the first 100-mile trail race, and it remains one of the most prestigious ultra races in the world. It's particularly challenging in that, you know, like with Western states, um, 100, like there, it has a lot of factors, right? But there's some forgiveness in there. Like, for instance, when I came in third to Western states, I sat in a chair for like more than 30 minutes, right? And I still came in third place because there's a little bit more of like, that's how trail ultras are. There's just a little bit more wiggle room and flexibility to how a race is going to be run. And for comrades, it's a lot more like a marathon, like a regular distance marathon in that if you make a mistake, there isn't, there's not a, a, a ton of room to come back from that. And so I think that that's what makes it challenging is knowing that the people are at the top of their game and that you have to run a very fast pace. You have to run it on very difficult terrain. It's going to be hot. You just, it just, I think the margin of error to get it right is so much smaller. And that's in part because of how fast the field is and how hard the terrain is. And never to be overlooked, those 90 kilometers at Comrades, that's a long way to go. The middle of the race, either direction, is the is the worst because it's rolling and you're not anywhere close to anything you know so like you're like oh the excitement of the start is gone and the excitement of the finish is not there so it's like it's just a grind you're just like in this hard part of the course there's not a lot of distraction and you just have a really far way to go so like just rolling through those hills is very difficult. And it just takes a lot of perseverance. So how does Devin approach such a challenge? One that she knows going in will be brutally demanding. And so for me, I actually, it's probably the race that I anticipate the most. But at the same time, I know that the way that I'm going to perform my best is by running my own race. So I just have to know, I basically just tell myself, this is going to be hard and it's going to be harder than I even am preparing myself for, you know, like I think it's going to be the hardest thing ever. And then it's, you know, twice as hard as that, but essentially bracing myself to not expect it to be easy, you know, at any point really helps me kind of get in that mode because it is, it's just relentless. You know, it's like, I just kind of get myself into the mentality that this is going to be hard and that I just can't quit. And when those tough times arise, as they inevitably do in a race like this, Devin's ready to deal with those in the moment, too. I think it's one of those things where it's like, I know I can do hard things because it has been so hard every time that I've done it that I it's rem- a reminder that I can persist even on the bad days, that I can persist through that and that tomorrow will come. It's actually funny, my second time doing the down year my mantra was tomorrow is monday like that is what got me through the race was like thinking the sun's gonna come up tomorrow right like it was harder than i wanted it to be i had hoped for a good day it wasn't you know a magical day and i was just like tomorrow's monday essentially like i was focusing on the fact of how do i want to feel tomorrow about this experience is your future self gonna be like oh, I know I could have kept going. Oh, I let myself off the hook. Or is is your future self going to say, like, I did everything I could to get to that finish line. I might not be able to convince myself in this moment that I'm having such a great time, but like I could convince myself that my future self would be satisfied with fighting through and finishing in spite of that. And I think that that was a very special lesson for me because it's like, there's plenty of things in life that are not going to be super fun and that you're going to want to go through, but you just have to look at it from the perspective of how am I going to think about this in the future? Is it worth it from that perspective? Another important factor for elites like Devin is that while she is running her own race, she's also running against other women. These are your competitors, but they're also people who are there to help. We like, especially on the women's side, all of us are trying to lift each other up for the most part and like push each other and help push the sport to new levels. So 
we tend to be more co- collaborative in that in that way because we want to see other people succeed just as much as we want to succeed. To be clear here, collaboratively pushing each other and the sport to new levels means engaging in respectful but also fierce competition. Fierce enough, it turns out, to override the pain of a broken foot. Here, Devin mentions Polly Shorts, that shortest but steepest climb on the course. It's also the final climb in the uprun. Runners hit it at the 79-kilometer or almost 50-mile mark. This makes it the critical make-it-or-break-it point because from there, it's downhill for the remaining kilometers to the finish. It's where you throw down the final gauntlet. Or, to use Devin's words, this is the point where you experience what's going to be the hardest thing ever, and it's twice as hard as that. Polly's is that part of the competition. And unfortunately, the high moment comes at the expense of my own teammate from KPMG because in the last, uh, I was going up Polly Shorts. I'm going up that hill and I'm in, I had been in like 11th to 14th place, like most of the day. So, you know, I was kind of like, okay, I'm not going to be in the top 10, like just do what you can. But I had moved up and I had been solidly in 11th for a really long time. And going up Polly Shorts, I see my teammate, Mary, and I'm like, oh no, I have to run her down. I am going to do everything in my power to, to get in that top 10. And she put up such a fight. Like it was a pretty amazing battle. And I finally caught her and I just, I went by her so hard and I felt so bad because like I said, she was my teammate, but at the same time, like this was this amazing moment for me to, I had been injured for so long and I still I didn't know that my foot was broken at the time like I had been misdiagnosed so I'd been running in pain for so long and I had missed races that I had wanted to go to so to kind of come back from all of that and be able to do that like it just felt so amazing and like so hard earned that, you know, it's like, as opposed to my position being like, I didn't have the day that I wanted. It's like, I exceeded what I thought was possible on that day. Um, and I really fought to the end. The miles run, the battles fought, the crowds embraced, the end does eventually come. It's always very relieving <laughs> to be done. It's, it is really a special experience to run into the stadium. I always get choked up. And I, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm I'm definitely a finish line crier when it's important and comrades is always important. And I, I just understand how special it is to run in the top 10. And so I really just appreciate that experience and I try to savor it. You know, I'm always a little paranoid that somebody's going to pass me. So you have that, like, I'm going to soak this up so much, but also like, I'm not going to get caught. But yeah, I mean, the crowds are amazing. And it's just such a satisfying thing to, you know, cross that finish line. I mean, granted, I cross the finish line every year and I'm like, I'm never doing that again because you're just like, oh my gosh, that was so hard. But that la- that feeling lasts for about five seconds. And it appears that not too long after those few ticks of the second hand, Devin begins recommitting herself to another go at this behemoth. You may be wondering, with such incredible performances already realized, what exactly is this white whale she's chasing? To answer this, Devin draws on insight from 2014 Comrades champion and friend, Ellie Greenwood. Uh, It's actually funny, Ellie Greenwood, who obviously has won the race, she has this phrase, she calls it a Devon day. And a Devon day is where everything comes together in this very magical way. And you just have like the race of your dreams. And I've had enough of those in my career to know that it's possible. And I just am holding out hope that I could have one of those at Comrades because it's, you know, it is so important to me. And I just know that like that distance, that speed is really in my wheelhouse. So I think that that's where that sense comes from is just knowing that I have not had yet the race that I'm capable of. In pursuit of her eponymous day, Devon keeps training and keeps exploring all that this basic act of putting one foot in front of the other has to offer. I love to run 
in part because running is never just one thing to me, right? On any given day, when I wake up, I can utilize running for a lot of different things. Some days I'm running just to be the best athlete that I can be, you know, to grow as an athlete, to challenge myself physically. Some days it's running as an emotional outlet. Some days it's a mental exercise. And I think that especially given that I run every different distance, every different surface, it's this opportunity. I see running as an opportunity to kind of explore a lot of different avenues. And it always surprises me that running can be so many different things to me. And that that is in part possible because I made the commitment to myself when I started running and becoming competitive that I wanted to run for my entire life, if that was possible. And so having that mentality means that I'm always mindful of the long term approach and not getting caught too caught up in one specific outcome or one specific path, because I don't want to ever have running be something that I burn out on. And so it's something that I feel like I'm always cultivating my relationship with running and making sure that it is like a very positive thing in my life. This is where Devin turns Melville's classic whale tale of corrosive obsession and death on its head. Ultimately, running has been a way for me to work through things and grow as a person. And the lesson that I've taken away, I've taken a lot of lessons away, but a lot of it has to do with the choice of how I see the moment and like how I deal with hard things. And ultimately, I've come to a place now where I tend to go towards the hard challenges when they're optional, like in running, I want to do a hard thing because I know that I'm capable of it. And the consequences are pretty low. And so then when I take the lesson to life, I'm like, I know that I have the stamina to do whatever it takes to get through a situation. You know, I've had plenty of hard things happen to me in my life, but running has helped me. It mirrors my, my actual perseverance and strength. And so if I can do something in an environment like running, it shows me that I am capable of doing it in real life. And that concludes Devin's story. For more information about this episode or about Strides Forward, please visit stridesforwardpodcast.com. One section you'll find there provides resources related to women and running. Each episode after the story, I'll highlight one such resource. The easy choice for this episode is Devin's blog. I've found many takeaways in her honest, in-depth, and insightful writing. The best way I've found to describe what she shares is that it feels like she squeezes every last bit of learning that she can out of the challenges she experiences. She goes deep and she's very open. For more frequent updates from Devin, where she also shares thoughts and insights, see her Instagram account, at fastfoodie. Please join me in two weeks for the next episode of Strides Forward. In the meantime, please stay in touch. You can reach me through the website, or on Twitter, at Strides Forward. I welcome all thoughts, questions, feedback, and community building efforts and suggestions. I wanna thank Devin Yanko for sharing her story and like all the runners in this first series, for taking a chance on a podcast that was just a passionate idea when she granted this interview. Thank you as well to April Mariner of Bonfire Collaborative for the logo and website design. You can find April at bonfirecollaborative.com. And thank you to Cormac O'Regan for the original music and sound design. And thank you to you, the listener. I'm thrilled you're joining this podcast journey. Please subscribe and share. One of the reasons I was inspired to start this podcast and to focus only on the incredible stories of women is because I was reminded recently that female athletes only receive 4% of sports media coverage. 
We can change that, and there are loads of amazing stories out there. Let's start sharing more of them. Until next time, this is Cherie wishing you satisfying strides forward. Whoops, that strides forward. Forward. Greetings from Evergreen Podcasts. We're rolling out a listener survey, and we want to hear from you. The information in the survey will help us gather statistics and in turn make our shows more appealing to advertisers. I know most people don't like ads, but this is one of the only ways our shows make money and help keep their lights on. We promise it will only take a few minutes, but the impact on our podcasts will be tremendous. As a token of our appreciation, we'll randomly select one lucky participant each month to win an exclusive merchandise package from Evergreen Podcasts. Head to evergreenpodcast.com slash listener survey to help a show and possibly get some free stuff for doing so. We can't thank you enough for the support. Now back to the show.